Let's we'll move on, please, to um, agenda item 10, uh, the specifications for specialised services. Ian. Uh, thank you. Um, our business is to uh, ensure patients get high quality care, and um, we have a particular set of responsibilities around uh, those patients using specialised services for which we ourselves will be um, commissioning um, uh, on behalf of the population of England. So this is really core business for us, uh, delivering for our patients. Uh, what I want to do in this paper, I think, is uh, give a little bit of context on our role in relation <coughs> to specialised services, um, and then talk a bit about the process um, of um, engagement and consultation in relation to uh, some clinical policies and um, some specifications. I'll discuss those in a minute. Um, firstly, let's just take a step back and look at what specialised services are. Well, specialised services, um, by their definition, tend to relate to either small numbers of people who have relatively rare conditions um, and or um, conditions that can only be treated by a relatively small number of expert sets of clinicians in the country. So they are, um, uh, that's the kind of working hypothesis um, on which they're based. More specifically, uh, they, they cover a fairly broad range of health conditions and diseases, um, which um, can be broken down into um, some long-term conditions and the response to them, so kidney disease, um, some serious uh, mental health related uh, issues uh, and cardiac care. <laughs> um, they relate to some particular episodes of specialist care, such as intensive care for neonates and um, children, and the care for patients who've had severe burns. Uh, they also relate to conditions that are rare, <coughs> such as uncommon cancers, medical genetics, and uh, the clinical response to uh, morbid obesity. So I think. There's a, there's a fairly broad range um, of um, conditions. Taken together, um, they relate to about 10% of the NHS budget, or around £11.8 billion. Um, so this is really important for the patients concerned. Um, it's also a big responsibility for this board, and we need to get it right for our sake as an organisation, but frankly, more importantly, for the, for the patients we serve here. Um, the situation we're inheriting has developed a lot uh, over the last few years since there was a really important report published in 2006, um, the Carter Report, which talked about you know, the need for improved consistency in the commissioning of these services across the whole of the country. But nonetheless, I think we have a significant opportunity um, to move things forward uh, and in particular to address the consequences um, of the way services were previously commissioned by 10 separate regionally based specialised commissioning teams and uh, a 11th team <coughs> which did the very rare conditions and which had an England reach. Um, and um, the consequence of that uh, was inevitable variation um, between the um, teams commissioning across the country. One of our objectives is as an organisation is the promotion of equality, and rightly so. And I think we have, I think, a real opportunity as we move into this field and build our arrangements um, to um, ensure that um, there's a consistent approach to the commissioning of these really important services for patients across the whole of the country. Specifically then, from April 2013, this board will be directly, will be the sole national commissioner of these defined range of services, um, about which I'll say a little bit more um, in a minute, uh, for England. Uh, we discharge that responsibility, um, as I think we discussed at uh, several meetings ago when we were first talking about the, the, the structure in the NHS that we have, um, through 10 of our local area teams. Um, the important distinction, though, is that while there were 10 specialised commissioning groups before, which are regionally based, and we've got 10 local area teams. That creates a superficial similarity. But I think it's really quite important to understand there's a distinct difference of approach. So previously, the 10 specialised teams had a budget on behalf of the population served by, those, um, by their boundaries. And they would contract with every provider in England on behalf of those patients to local standards as required. Our arrangement turns that on its head. Each of these 10 teams commission on behalf of England 
for every English patient who uses the services which are provided by hospitals in that geographical area. And so our, our aspiration here um, is to um, offer the highest quality care um, against a single national set of service specifications, standards, policies, and quality measures. So that, I think, is a, an important and, and significant aspiration for this board. To get to where we are now, the Department of Health, as part of its overall approach to the transition, um, commissioned a significant review of specialist services, um, set up a clinical advisory group made up of both GPs and hospital doctors um, to look at exactly which services we should be commissioning from 2013. That has um, now uh, reported and defined the services, and that's why I'm able to talk to you about the magnitude of, of what, we're here, what we're trying to do today. Since then, um, there's been significant work looking at um, what needs to be done in relation to those services, and there have been 60 clinically-led reference groups um, looking at the range of conditions um, as part of the process of moving towards transition. The, um, those groups have produced um, 132 um, service specifications so far, and 51 clinical commission in policies which we need to deal with now. Just a bit of definitional <coughs> stuff. A service specification um, is a clear description of what a service is um, and the acceptable standards that need to be in place for their delivery. They will include outcome measures and quality standards. Um, and um, a commissioning policy describes the eligibility and access criteria to a service or for a drug or for a device or for an intervention. All of these need to be based on evidence, engagement with patients, and the best possible professional clinical advice. So we've now received these 132 service specifications and 51 clinical commissioning policies, um, and we need to manage them in a proper process. The uh, uh, processes so far have been subject to three separate assurances, assurance processes. So they've been looked at by a clinical assurance group. They've been assessed financially and equally importantly, if not more importantly, there's been a degree of patient engagement through uh, working with a patient and public engagement steering group. That isn't the end of the business, though. That's the first stage here. And what I'm coming to you today to um, seek your approval on is moving through a phased process of further engagement with patients and stakeholders um, to get to the right place for us uh, so we can be confident we're in the right place for patients by the, uh, by the time we have to go live with these. So the first stage in that process um, is a, a request today from me to you that, hearing what you've heard, um, you are happy for us to go out to an, a, a, an engagement process, um, a consultation process um, with stakeholders um, over the next uh, few weeks, um, which will enable us to listen to their comments um, and, um, as required, respond to those um, in relation to the work we've done so far. Uh, we then need to go through a clinical prioritisation process um, and bring it back um, for the consideration at board. Uh, in Para 19, this paper was written some time ago, um, we had hoped and potentially might still do, but I think it's unlikely to bring that to the December board meeting. Um, what I need to just note, to ask you to note, is if we do, as I suspect we might, get a lot of response, we need to have the time to consider those responses properly. And so I think I'll need to take away, Chairman, um, looking at our meeting structure, how we might bring that back, having had, I don't want to curtail the amount of time that we, we can have to listen to people's responses. Having done that, um, and the board having considered that, uh, we will then go into a final significant consultation on the whole package um, so that we can make a final response to comments, revision as required, and ultimately a decision on what we do for next year. So there's, there's a long bit of process that's led us to this place. There's process we have to go through, uh, and then there's a decision to be taken. We're kind of in the middle of that process now, and uh, I hope what I've been able to do is give you a sense of why this is really important for patients and why it's really important for us. Um, secondly, um, to give you some assurance of the amount of work that's been put in to get us to where we are. But thirdly, and importantly, to talk about the forward process and to seek your permission to proceed with it. Thank you, Ian. Comments? Good. Thank you. Yes. 
Yes, thank you. Barbara. Just a bit of clarification, Ian. As I understand it, um, the, um, the review that was done by the clinical advisory group and its recommendations to the department mm. has resulted in an increase in those things, the volume of services which were truly defined as specialised commissioning. And that in addition to that, your work has shown that there were some areas um, that, that should have been defined as specialised commissioning which were not uh, being, being um, commissioned by specialised commissioning groups. And that those two things put together um, results in an increase in the volume of specialised commission which will be undertaken by the board. Um, and that alongside that, there's been a careful and commensurate transfer of the funding um, uh, because there is a, an inevitable reduction in the services, a small reduction, albeit compared to the other things they do, but a small reduction in the services CCGs uh, will we'll have to commission and therefore a small reduction in their resource. So you're right to raise that. Um, uh, this has been a clinically led process. Yeah. Um, which is important, I think, here. That, you know, this is uh, uh, a process that's been run against four criteria, um, looking at the number of people who need the services, so looking at rarity, looking at the number of clinical teams in, in England that are capable of responding, looking at you know, those services that have relatively small numbers of providers, uh, and importantly, looking at um, uh, the financial uh, cost of, of, of commissioning the service, so looking for high cost, low volume services, and then specifically considering um, the financial implications, particularly for CCGs, if CCGs were to commission those. I think particularly where you've got um, the really important um, services that happen to be high cost and low volume, there's a, a need for a, a process, a clinically led process, but a process nonetheless, that looks to um, insulate CCGs from the unpredictable risk of having a, a small number of very expensive patients that when we look across the whole of England, we're providing a kind of collective risk pool for. Uh, and that if it was taken within a CCG, it could potentially be a very significant hit on their budget. Um, and, and therefore, those are the, the, the criteria that have been gone through. That has resulted, as you say, in um, some expansion of um, the, the basket of clinical procedures that, that we need to commission. The second point is also right. They, um, as part of the previous inconsistency, um, different baskets of services were, uh, mm. were purchased by the 10 specialised commissioning groups. Uh, and, and by definition, if we put those together, some, I think, in some cases, have actually gone back to CCGs, which is appropriate and where we should, we should do that if we can, because they, they aren't within that nationally defined uh, clinically driven um, set of uh, procedures, but as you say, where that has not been uh, handled at the right level, we, we need to bring it to a, into the consistent England-wide approach in, in order to deliver our objectives um, uh, as I've outlined. So I think you've raised an important point. It is quite complex methodologically, um, but I look forward to a conversation um, with uh, clinical commissioning groups and others about how that process and how we've got here. Ian, thank you very much. I mean, this is immensely important work for us. Um, it's a huge part of our budget, especially now that the greater part of the, the, the further resources have been brought in and the further range of specialised services defined. But it's also an area in which we want to be an exemplar, uh, both in the way in which we design this process, and thank you for the painstaking work that's been going into it, uh, and also, of course, in launching it and, and developing it in the future. So that this becomes the, the starship for um, our clinical commissioning across the sector. Thank you. So thank you for that. Um, I take it that the board are happy to endorse the proposed consultation process. Thank you very much.